for it. All right. Well, thank, thank you all uh, for joining us um, again this week. It feels like a deja vu here. Uh, so thanks, thanks for coming back for part two of uh, this series on dementia. Um, real quickly, I'm Stephen Thelke. I'm a geriatric psychiatrist at the VA in the Geriatric Research Education and Clinical Center. Um, and uh, the one announcement I need to make is that we're going to close down the chat box during uh, the, the part that I'm talking, which hopefully won't go too close to 4.30 or uh, 5.30. Um, and uh, we'll open it up again. So if you need to send somebody a message, apparently you can right click on their name and uh, private text them. So uh, today's topic is uh, medications uh, for dementia. And I, last week when I uh, started off, I expressed my uh, general sense of frustration at uh, trying to talk about de dementia and get the point across. And I have a, a similar uh, frustration about treatments for dementia, but it's a, a little more specific. And when, when I talk about treatments, um, my, my concern is always that when I get done, I've talked about what all the options are, what the FDA indications are, and I, I fear that I leave the impression that because the treatments are there, everybody should go out and use them. And if anybody's got dementia, they need to be on these treatments. And in, in fact, when I step back, I realize that's exactly the opposite of what I'm trying to say. And in fact, what I'd like to do is to, to use our time to talk about what the treatments are, but, but even more importantly, to talk about what sort of treatments might help people and why would we want to use any treatments at all and what are the ways that you can help people to meet their needs instead of just following a, official guidelines or uh, rules. So what I wanted to do is spend a little bit of time thinking about what treatment is and how you can use information to uh, guide the best treatments, and uh, after that to uh, focus on what the treatments for dementia specifically are um, in terms of the FDA-approved medications with uh, some careful scrutiny of, of what the data uh, actually shows, and then to look at agitation again, which we touched on briefly last week, and then finally to readdress this question of what, what exactly the right thing to do in terms of treatment is. So when you think about the, the act of applying a treatment um, and how we use science or knowledge to inform that decision, you pretty quickly realize um, that treatment is a moral instead of a factual act. It's telling somebody they should be doing something. You give them a prescription or you advise them you should take this pill or you tell them you should or shouldn't do something. And implicit in that is the idea that if they do that, they're going to accomplish something. And you may, you usually don't say exactly what it is. You'll just tell them, here, you should take this because you've got this condition. But if you really go back and, and look for what you're trying to get to, it's some kind of good. So you're, you're trying to help people to get something that they want or something that you want or something that you consider to be the right thing to do. And no amount of factual information is going to tell you what that good thing is. And I'll give you a few examples of this. The facts can help you to get to that point. If you're saying, I want to maximize lifespan, then you can find all the data about different treatments and pick the one that seems to have the greatest statistical probability of enhancing lifespan. Or if you're trying to reduce a symptom, you could pick evidence that would you know, suggest medications that would help reduce that symptom. But the facts themselves won't tell you if it's what you're trying to accomplish is reducing a symptom or extending life or whatever it is that, that you're trying to get to. So factual information, um, studies, research, uh, scientific evidence can help you to get to an end, but it won't tell you what the end is. And this has, has been explained in uh, more philosophical terms by the uh, Scottish uh, 18th century philosopher David Hume who has something called Hume's Law, which is basically that you can't go from is statements to should statements. That the should part of it requires a different kind of assumption and a different sort of knowledge, and that no matter how much you know, it won't tell you what the right thing to do is or what you're trying to accomplish. So here's a few examples of, of the things that you might want to accomplish by applying a, a treatment in general. So you might say your goal is to reduce people's symptoms, whatever, whatever they are. Um, 
or you could say that your only goal is to cure people or to extend their lifespan. Or maybe if you get more sophisticated and you say, well, what if I extend lifespan but they're miserable the whole time? What I really want to do is extend the, their quality adjusted lifespan. Um, you could also pr provide other um, forms of good, like I do whatever the patient says is important. You know, it's not me who's at stake, it's whatever they come in and tell me that they want to accomplish that I'll, I'll help, help them with. Or if you're dealing in psychi psychiatric terms, if somebody's a risk to society, if they're homicidal or they're going to do something dangerous, then your goal is not to help them directly at all, but rather to, to treat um, them so that public safety will be improved. There's, there's any number of um, goods that, that can be sought. And I wanted to present a, a real quick scenario um, just to, to under, underline this point. There's a, a um, let's say you've got a young patient who comes in um, and there's a, they're suffering from a life-threatening condition and there's a treatment that you can apply for this condition that will save their life, um, e extend their life by many, many years. It's assumed uh, to be quite safe medically um, and doesn't really have any serious complications. And yet the standard a pra of practice a, a pretty much across everyone who discusses this is that you would not force the patient to have this treatment. Anybody think what that would be? This is uh, not, not dementia, it's, it's uh, un unrelated. So this is like a, a blood transfusion for somebody who's a Jehovah's Witness, who refuses blood transfusions on religious grounds, and they say, I would rather not be alive than have a blood transfusion. And pretty much everybody who considers this ethically says that if the person's an adult, they're of sound mind, they can make that decision, and you don't force the person to have a blood transfusion, even if you're going to add years and years to their lives. When you're dealing with kids, it's different. But this is, is just to underline that if you say your goal is to save life, you'll run into situations where you end up saving life, but you violate another principle. So this is, this is a complicated issue, and, and you could spend lots of time talking about how you balance off different forms of good. But I just wanted to propose initially um, that when we apply a treatment, we're trying to accomplish some good that we often don't specify and it may be conflicting with other goods, and um, oftentimes it may not be the same thing that the patient sees. So with regard to dementia, um, here's some different ways that you could propose a treatment for dementia to uh, somebody who has early dementia. And so on, on the left, um, you could say this would be the, the most cut and dried uh, pharmaceutical um, pharmaceutically based uh, dr drug company endorsed message, which would be, we've got these treatments, they're approved by the FDA, they treat the disease, you should take one. You know, who, you know that's, that's all there is to it. You don't, you don't even think about what you're trying to accomplish. Or you could say, well, we've got these treatments, they accomplish certain goods, but they don't really produce the kind of absolute good that you might be interested in and ask the person if they'd want to take one. Or in the third column, you could say, well, we've got these treatments. Uh, they don't really change what happens. Not everybody gets helped by them, and they treat only symptoms, and then, then ask the person if they wanted to take one. Or you could say, um, as, as the right column shows, that we don't have any treatments for this condition that really fix the problem. It's an incurable condition, as we see. They're expensive. They may be dangerous. You shouldn't take one. So what you, what you realize when you look at all these is that you can use your form of scientific evidence to back up any one of these claims. Um, there is no truth up there. It's, it's the one that you pick. And if you're dealing with people who have dementia, or you're making your own decisions about you know, family members or, or other people who need treatments for dementia, you ultimately are faced with this kind of decision. And really what you need to define is what you're trying to accomplish rather than what the science tells you. So just because um, a drug is FDA approved does not mean that everybody should be taking it who has the condition. And we know that um, the, the act of giving and, and taking medications is a very complex behavior. It's, it's not just like you know, in, in, uh, you know, buying something simple and then you know, buying a piece of food and eating it. It's very different. There's a, there's a lot of meaning to the act of, of taking a medication or giving somebody a medication. 
And the reasons for prescribing a medication, like following guidelines, ultimately are a lot less important than the reasons why people would take the medication, like if it's helping them to lead a better life. So real quickly, I wanted to, to raise the, the question of why people might want to use a medication to treat dementia or other conditions, even if they don't perceive any specific benefit or effect from it. Anybody think real, real fast of why uh, families might want to want to be giving a pill or a treatment, even if they, I, I, I see this in my practice. I'll, people will start a pill, people will come back, I'll say, what's it doing? We don't know if it's doing anything. Well, should we stop it? No, let's keep taking it. Anybody? Well, yeah, so there's a potential placebo effect um, that, that just the act of giving the pill might, might be beneficial. And I think that that's kind of the crux of it. And, and the act of giving the pill is an act of love and of hope. It's when you give the person with dementia the pill, it's we're not giving up on you. You know, there's, this might help. You know, even if you really know it's not going to help, that it's a sign that you're not quitting. So the, the act of um, having a medication that you can give and continuing to give it means something, and that's regardless of whether or not there's a measurable benefit. So it's not like um, simply knowing whether there's a measurable effect either according to FDA criteria or according to any individual's experience would tell you whether it's the right thing to do to, start, to stop a medication. The other rationale that people have is, well, you know, he has gotten worse while he's been taking this, but think how bad it would have been if we hadn't been using it. And that's another form of defense, kind of like the not giving up hope that tells you we're doing the right thing. Um, we're, we're not quitting, we're, we're, uh, we're continuing to fight this. So there's a, a lot of complicated psychology involved. So I wanted to, to give you the, a perspective of somebody um, who had stronger ideas on this even, even than, than I do. Um, and this is William Osler, who's considered the, one of the fathers of modern medicine. He's one of the founders of Johns Hopkins University, and there's multiple diseases named after him. So he came out pretty strongly and uh, said, and, and he wasn't kidding here, that one of the, the first duties of uh, physicians is to get p educate people not to take medicines, because he, he saw them as, as being largely quackery. Um, and in, in those days, there, there were more patent medicines sold, but, but his I idea was that you need to, your job is to get people to be skeptical about what they're taking. And he also foresaw uh, the, the movement that we've had of the enormous power of drug companies, and as he called them, big manufacturing pharmacists, who he b believed were enslaving people in this plausible pseudoscience that, that medications are the, the fix for all ills. So um, when, when you think about how medications uh, can be used, there's a wide variety of perspectives, and some of them tell you that we really should be much more careful about using medications. So I wanted to, to pre present real quickly um, an, an overview of the, the challenge with, with picking what outcomes matter. And this relates to what the good is that you're trying to accomplish. So if you're going to get FDA approval for a drug, you've got to say that it accomplishes a benefit in some specific domain, and then the FDA says, well, yeah, that, that domain matters, and you were able to make a difference, therefore we'll approve your drug. But what is the outcome that really matters? And we're going to come back to this again and again with the medications for dementia in, in that the outcomes that have been used to approve the drugs and to make the drugs look good generally do not map well onto what anybody cares about. So um, on the left, you see there's a big difference between the red bar and the, or the, the red line and the yellow line. And it looks like whoever was in the red line was doing a lot better. And uh, you sure wouldn't want to be in that yellow line. Therefore, you'd want to join the, join the red group there. Um, however, on the right, it looks like those two lines are the same. So this is the same medication. Um, the study on the right was a little bit less biased and a larger sample. but depending on which outcome you'd pick, you'd say, well, geez, everybody should be on this pill or this pill is a waste of money. So what outcome is used as the um, defining characteristic is very important for uh, def defining whether something might be worthwhile to try or not. So I, I um, 
ask, ask your uh, forgiveness for this uh, rather length, lengthy um, introduction about the, the context of, of giving medications and of determining whether or not it's the right thing to use medications. But I think that without this, and if you just jump in and start looking at all the, the data, which mainly looks like the stuff on the left, you'll be left with the impression that there's all these things out there that really should, you know, that do help people in whatever they want and that therefore everybody should be on them. Whereas if you step back and think about what you're trying to accomplish, um, you, you realize it's a much more complicated picture. All right. So with, with that introduction, what I wanted to do is review uh, from last week uh, briefly what uh, dementia looks like um, and what the main symptoms are that might, one might want to treat. And then to look in detail at the cholinesterase inhibitors, which are the main uh, type of medication that's approved for treating Alzheimer's uh, disease and other forms of dementia. And then memantine, which is a, another class of medication. And then to um, focus uh, briefly on the other dementias. And as we'll see, there's not much there. And then finally, to discuss the behavioral symptoms of dementia, which we touched on last week, but we can say quite a lot more about. So as a, as a recap, um, this is the, the definition we talked about last week of dementia, that it's a significant chronic loss in memory and or mental functions involving structural damage to the brain. And as I pointed out last week, the most important part of this to remember for remembering what dementia is or is not is that it's structural damage. Um, it's not a neurotransmitter problem. It's not a reversible problem. As, as we, we saw in these slides, uh, this slide here, the neurons died. So eventually it becomes gross pathology, but initially it's pathology that you see on um, brain slices in certain layers of the cortex. But because the neurons have died in the hundreds of millions or even billions, um, they're not coming back. Um, that's not how the, uh, the adult brain works. There's plasticity and branching of neurons, but neurons are not regenerating. So dementia is not a curable disease insofar as you will get uh, recovery of all the neurons that have died. That's not to say there might not be treatments that could halt the progression or somehow create other forms of remodeling, uh, but, but nonetheless, dementia is a progressive disease. It's a neurodegenerative disease, and the cells have died. So that's the, the most important context. And I, I think I mentioned last week that if you look at the ads for medications for Alzheimer's, they'll show somebody who seems to be cured. Um, and, and that really is, is not the case. And um, when you think about what's going on in the process, you have to remember the underlying context. So then, then the question is, why would you want a medication for a disease that's incurable and progressive? So, this is, is pretty obvious that if there may be other benefits that you could provide, that even if you're not going to cure it, that you may be able to improve symptoms that people care about, or you may be able to modify the course of the disease so that it's still incurable and it's still progressive, but it, it's progressive on a slower scale. So the, the goal um, for any of the existing treatments that we have is not a cure. Um, and and I, I, on a psychiatric uh, association mailing list where at least once a week I get an update of a new medication that they've come out that in a small study has promised for curing Alzheimer's. I've been getting these for probably six years. Um, and every week there's another small study. And so far we are no, no closer to a drug that would cure the disease or that would even prevent it. So when you're thinking about why you'd, you'd want to treat in order to change disease course or to um, treat symptoms, you also need to consider what the level of risk is that you would undertake in order to accomplish a certain benefit. So there's, there's no treatment that does not involve some risk. And we'll, we'll see there are, are risks involved, both in terms of side effects um, and also in terms of things like cost um, that influence how, how much one really would want to use a treatment in order to accomplish a goal. So the, the symptoms um, that uh, you might want to improve, um, as we talked about last week, are part of the definition of dementia. And then we'll talk about some of the other related symptoms that, that occur. So um, as, as we mentioned, for a diagnosis of dementia, you need to have a 
problem with memory, or this is Alzheimer's disease, memory plus a problem with production of speech, carrying out coordinated activities, recognition of things, or executive dysfunction, things like balancing a checkbook, and then you need to have a significant functional impairment associated with that. And you'd think that, that these would be important symptoms to treat. You know, if somebody's having trouble speaking or doing things, that if you could give them a boost in those areas, that they would be happier and, and uh, more functional. And certainly, in terms of the, the functional impairments, you'd think that would make a difference. And this, this may be true. It's, it's hard to say absolutely. But I would remind you of the, the other point that we made last week, that oftentimes insight is the first thing to go in dementia. And that um, people with dementia, for the most part, are pretty much OK with how they're doing, um, that they're not complaining or worried about the loss of memory, and they're going with the flow. Um, so that, that movie that, I, that just came out, um, just Still Alice, just Alice, Still Alice, um, is, is a very different presentation of this, where the lady is totally freaked out that she can't remember things. But the patients I see don't seem to mind all that, that much um, through, through the course of the disease. So if, if you reframe it as in that way, a medication that increased people's insight could even be something harmful, because then they'd be worried about it. And the New York Times did a big series uh, where they examined people who got an early diagnosis of dementia that was pretty, pretty well established. And they asked them about the experience of that. And pretty uniformly, people said, I wish I didn't know. You know, it's, um, it would be better just to live my life and not worry about the effects that this would have on my person and my family. So if you're going to provide a treatment that would increase that level of self-awareness in a negative way, you're, you're not helping yourself. So once again, just because there are symptoms associated with the disease doesn't mean that treating the symptoms is going to make everything better. So al along with um, the cognitive symptoms, there are um, quite a few uh, behavioral symptoms that often occur in the disease. So this is a, a categorization scheme that, that's used for uh, problematic behaviors, but they're pretty much what you'd expect, um, that the people can't keep track of where they are, that they get upset, and that they show different forms of agitation, um, and that, that when they try to carry out activities that may be unsafe, that those are dangerous too. This um, doesn't necessarily have to be aggressive. Um, the, one of the saddest cases I, I ever saw was a an uh, older, older couple who had been very close through their lives, and the husband developed dementia. And as he lost insight into what he had done and his short-term memory failed, he spent his whole day following his wife around saying, I love you, I love you, I love you. And it just drove her crazy because she never got a, a minute. Um, and it was very hard um, because she didn't, you know, she also would feel guilty about you know, telling him to go away when he kept doing this. And ultimately, he had to be placed in... Uh, of institutional care because of this behavior. So it, it wasn't aggressive, it wasn't screaming, but the repetitive part of it was, was very difficult to deal with. So um, the, the problematic behaviors don't necessarily involve people acting out or, or being violent. But in this case, you would assume that if you had a treatment that helped these, that that would um, provide some benefit to patients and to caregivers. Unfortunately, what we'll see is that you shouldn't combine the cognitive symptoms and the behavioral symptoms and assume that if one of them is helped, that the other is helped. Because we'll see that there are no medications approved to treat behavioral issues related to Alzheimer's or other forms of dementia, whereas the medications that we have are approved to treat the cognitive symptoms. So there is a variety of other neuropsychiatric uh, symptoms. And these, these ones are um, in, involved in other psychiatric conditions, um, and they're assumed to be uh, noxious or unpleasant in, in and of themselves. You know, if somebody's delusional or paranoid or very depressed, you assume that that involves an internal state of distress or unhappiness, and that if you could improve that, then the, the person would, get, would, would feel better over time. Um, it's not like you need to ask them, you know, do you want to be depressed? Um, Unfortunately, um, here again, we'll see that it can be quite challenging to uh, treat these problems. 
Um, and I, I think we pointed out last week, and we'll talk more about the agitation part of it, is that the delusions in dementia are not really bizarre delusions. They're more misinterpretations of things. Like your wallet was there, um, now it's not there, and somebody was recently here or they're here now. Well, obviously, they stole your wallet. And that's because something goes missing and, and a person's around who may have taken it, and they took it. So the, the question would be, how much of a pill would you want to give? Or would you want to snow somebody heavily in order to stop them from experiencing that? Or are there other ways that you can deal with these problems uh, that would have as much benefit? The, um, these, these symptoms, the cognitive symptoms, are part of the definition of dementia. But the uh, behavioral and neuropsychiatric ones don't occur in, in everyone. And in fact, they're not all that common. So this big uh, study of the Cache, Cache County population um, in Utah, which is a, a large group of people they followed over many years, only about 20% of people who lived in the community with Alzheimer's disease had significant behavioral symptoms while they observed them. So that's one in five. It's not, not that much. Um, and the, certainly my, my clinical experience at the VA, where we see people who get referred because there's some other issue, uh, we don't see everybody with Alzheimer's, but even there, maybe a third of people have a behavioral problem, but the vast majority of people with Alzheimer's don't have any of these significant behavioral problems. So it's not like you assume everybody who's got dementia is going to run into this. And when you look at the course or natural history of the disease, the cognitive symptoms tend to worsen pretty pre predictably, as we talked about the, the progressive nature of the disease, but the behavioral symptoms fluctuate more over time. And of those, the, the one that seems to be most persistent is just being agitated or, or restless. So let's, let's um, go quickly, the, the big picture view of what's available out there to um, treat dementia. And we'll talk about these two categories of medications. One is the cholinesterase inhibitors, and one is uh, memantine. So this is to treat the cognitive symptoms. These are, are drugs that are approved to, to treat that, that first list of symptoms that I talked about related to cognition. The number of medications approved to treat behavioral symptoms, zero. So uh, we'll, we'll see this wasn't for lack of trying, um, but there are no medications approved. So everything we talked about re with regard to um, medications for agitation, other behavioral problems in dementia is off-label. And just as a reminder about the preventive part of it, there's no medications approved to prevent Alzheimer's either. Uh, and I, I discussed that uh, National Institute on Aging study that, that looked at all the potential factors associated with dementia and found that none of them uh, seemed to have evidence for preventing dementia, even though some of them were associated with dementia, like hypertension and diabetes. So, you know, when, this, this lecture could be pretty short because um, we're only talking about two types of medication. Um, so maybe that's why I felt the need to go into all that other, other detail. Um, but we'll, we'll see that, that those, those aren't even that straightforward. So I, I mentioned there wasn't a lack of trying. I, I, just for fun, I, I searched for um, you know, Alzheimer's treatment and dementia treatment and categorized the, all the different types of drug that had come up that, that had been carried out in at least one trial um, that for either the treatment or prevention of dementia, and there were more than 50 of them. And I'll, I'll just list, list some of them to show you the, the broad scope of things that people have tried. So pretty much all the antidepressants had been looked at. Um, antipsychotics, um, other psychiatric medications, cardiovascular drugs, uh, dr drugs that are used as, as abuse potential, uh, seizure medications, the cannabinoids one is interesting because I'm getting more and more pe families come in and say, "Should we, you know, should we give him uh, marijuana when he gets upset?" And so I, you know, I don't know. It doesn't sound like a great idea to me. But um, one family swears that it was the the treatment that um, really made the behavioral symptoms go away. Um, ho hormonal agents, um, vitamins. I'm sure you you just if you happen to to watch. Uh, Daytime television, you, you can't uh, miss the, the fact that you know, there's all sorts of other treatments that you know, Dr. Oz uh, has, has promoted. Uh, the biggest one on the internet seems to be coconut oil. Um, all the supplements, 
Cholinesterase inhibitors we'll talk about. These are uh, other rare uh, treatments. Methylene blue is a dye that's been studied extensively that people think will uh, remove all the plaques and tangles. Intranasal insulin, was it's still a big uh, trial <laughs> underway um, by a former colleague of mine, Suzanne Kraft. Ciproterone is a, an androgen blocker that's used um, for treating sex offenders, interesting. It's just, it's just every possible drug people have thrown at the disease thinking, well, maybe it'll, it'll work better. And in a lot of the small trials, um, sure enough, you get positive results. Unfortunately, none of these ever got as far as a, you know, a, a really big trial, except for a few of them. And in those cases, the findings have been negative also. So for instance, that my former boss um, at the VA conducted a huge study of uh, NSAIDs, uh, anti-inflammatory drugs, for the prevention of dementia using a group of people who were at high risk. And um, it turns out that the, the people, when they analyzed all the data, the people who got the drug looked like they got dementia at a slightly higher rate, uh, which is uh, hard, hard to explain, um, but just goes to, to show you that we don't have any simple preventative strategies. And this one I, I came across, people have even studied acupuncture. Um, this was oddly acupuncture in combination with the drug nemotapine. Um, that, that found that acupuncture may be a benefit. So there's been a, a ton of, of different approaches. Um, none of them really have uh, panned out. And as we'll see, the cholinesterase inhibitors have been shown to have uh, improved some symptoms, but whether or not they really improve things that matter is another question. So I wanted to discuss how the, the cholinesterase inhibitors work and look at the data for those um, and then present an overview or uh, that some, some overviews that the people have um, dis discussed in the, the literature about what all this means. So cholinesterase inhibitors, um, so acetylcholine is a um, both a neurotransmitter and, uh, or it's a neurotransmitter that works both centrally and in the periphery. Um, it, so it's in the, the, the brain and through the body and um, acetylcholine cholinesterase breaks down acetylcholine. So by blocking the enzyme that breaks down acetylcholine, you end up with higher levels of acetylcholine. And if you remember, there's the two parts of the nervous system, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. And the sympathetic is um, a flight or fight res response. Uh, if, you, if you increase that, then you get increases in heart rate and, and blood pressure and re respiration rate. And the parasympathetic is more known as the feed and breed response, which slows down heart rate, um, in increases gastric secretions, and gets the, the body to, to slow down more. So cholinesterase in the, the periphery of the, the body increases parasympathetic tone. So the, the main side effect is a reduction, slight reduction in heart rate and then you also get more lung secretions, more gastric secretions, you know, the things that would happen after you ate a large meal, for instance. Um, and then in the brain, we'll talk about the specific effects. So these are the four drugs that are approved for the, um, in, in relation to Alzheimer's disease. Um, and I, I'm not going to go into the specific details of these, except in a, a little bit about the ind indications later. So in the, the brain, um, acetylcholine is one of the main neurotransmitters, uh, in addition to serotonin and uh, dopamine and histamine. Um, and this is, is where it or originates. Um, and when you think about what acetylcholine does in the brain, it's hard to pin down exactly. But roughly, it has to do with level of ar arousal, um, so how alert you are and attention, so the ability to focus on tasks, as well as uh, what, what's roughly called the vigilance, so ability to stick to something or, or be aware of your surroundings. And it's interesting, when you look at the list of different neurotransmitters and what they're supposed to do, the one that's involved in memory is dopamine, um, whereas all the drugs, we, we saw them on that list, that affect dopamine seem not to help much in um, dementia. So this is, is one that um, they're in people who have Alzheimer's, those cell bodies there, the nucleus basalis and the pedunculopontine nucleus, um, clearly um, deteriorate. And there's 
um, lower levels of acetylcholine in the brain of people with Alzheimer's. So you'd think that by boosting that level, you would return the person more to a normal state. So we'll, we'll, we'll see what the, the overall effects are. The side effects of these medications generally aren't, aren't severe at all, and usually they go away after you reach a stable dose, and they make sense based on this parasympathetic um, tone uh, factor. So people get a little bit of stomach upset, a little bit of diarrhea, and their heart rate goes down. So if somebody has bradycardia to begin with, like if their heart rate's in the 50s, you got to be careful. Or if they have peptic ulcer disease, this can, can worsen ulcers. Or if they have COPD, you can worsen gastric secretions. But none of those are absolute contraindications, and usually if you plan carefully and make sure you don't go up on the dose really fast. The, these kind of side effects are not very significant. So you, I'm sure you're aware there's other medications that are known as anticholinergics, and that's the same thing. That's the, instead of cholinesterase inhibitor, these are drugs that block the receptor for um, uh, acetylcholine. And when you look both in um, test, test tube studies and in animal models and in the human data, what you see is that the anticholinergic drugs are far, far more powerful than the cholinesterase inhibitors, which means that if somebody is on an anticholinergic, you're just wasting any effort involved in increasing levels of acetylcholine. So if, if somebody is on one, any, any form of drug that does have strong um, anticholinergic properties, then you might as well just not waste your time with the cholinesterase inhibitor. And this, this has not gotten much attention, but there, there's been some recent study that, that illustrates that, that that is a um, pretty um, uh, well-established finding. Um, and it, there's, there's really no other significant drug-drug interaction. So um, on, on balance, these are, are quite safe medications, and it's, it's not like you have to be very careful in using them. So let, I wanted to, to uh, turn to some of the the results, and there's dozens of studies that have been done with these, most of them funded um, by the, the drug makers that suggest that for certain domains in certain studies, uh, you get benefits in terms of cognition. So this is a, a study of Dinepazil compared to placebo over a one-year period, and the, the mini-mental score uh, declined in the placebo group, and it stayed about the same in the, the people on the, the medication. Um, this is another one. This is the ADAS-COG. It's a cognitive measure of the one, one score. And here they're really not being honest because they, they follow people out to a year on the um, drug, um, but then they have this projected value, which is the little dotted line, saying, well, if the placebo group had continued as bad for a year as they did for six months, look how much worse they'd be. Um, but the placebo group didn't continue that badly. In fact, they bounced back a little bit. So this um, is clearly hand-waving, and it's a little bit harder here to say at a year there's a difference between groups, but at, at six months it seems like there is one. And then this this is mislabeled. That's not MMSE. That's um, ADAS-COG, and this makes it look like the people on the placebo are worsening and the people who have got uh, galantamine uh, at uh, either of the two doses had an improvement. So if you only had data like this, you'd say, well, this is, this is great. We're going to um, you know, take the people who have dementia, give them this treatment. They're going to be better. You know, at, at five months, they're better. Maybe at a year, they're better. And this is going to solve the problem. Unfortunately, when you do uh, larger studies with less selection bias and address outcomes that really matter to people, you find there is far less difference between people who got a, a drug and people who got a placebo. And I, I don't have a specific slide on the issue of um, selection bias, but you're, you're probably aware that in most of the drug studies, the number of people who participate is far less than the number of people who would be eligible or who have the condition. Because when you're studying the conditions, you have to rule out people who have other conditions or comorbidities or who, or who are frail or don't have long to live. So I, I recently reviewed the um, several papers that looked at 
uh, retention rates for drug Alzheimer's drug studies, and the percentage of people who was included in the study compared to the, the percentage of people who would be eligible um, ranged from 1 to 15 percent. So in some of the studies, 1 percent of the people who you really want to care about are in the study, and those are the ones you're generalizing from, and in the highest value is about 15 percent. Sue Borson has done some, some really interesting work in this area. So um, selection bias is a, is a huge problem. And this study here, um, which is known as the AD500 study, that's still the, the largest um, study that's, that was done um, of a community sample. This was done in England. It was funded by the British National Health Service. Um, and they had a much lower dropout rate. So they retained more people. And what they found is that um, over a two-year period, there was about a point eight difference in the mini mental score. That's on a 30-point scale. And then a one-point improvement in ADLs on a 17-point scale. Um, those were the cognitive outcomes. And then when they looked at whether or not people had to go into institutional care, there was no difference at all between groups over a period of four years. And their conclusion from this study was that there were no significant differences between the, the cholinesterase inhibitor and placebo in the behavioral and neuropsychological symptoms in terms of the degree of um, distress or pathology experienced by the caregiver or what the costs were or the amount of time that went involved or adverse events. So these are the issues that really would matter to caregivers, especially if they're looking for some treatment that would make their life easier. And this large and pretty carefully controlled study did not find any evidence of that. So just in, in case you think that I'm skewing the, the, the data or spinning it too much, this is from the British Medical Journal, which is a, a very well-respected um, journal that carefully you know, considers everything they published. And, and when they did a um, systematic review of cholinesterase inhibitors for Alzheimer's, they reached pretty much the same conclusion, that even though there's lots of studies that um, suggest there may be benefits, that um, these recommendations aren't really evidence-based when you look at what true evidence is, and that the differences were minimal. So these, these kind of differences that you see when you see them in the big picture really don't add up to a significant consistent benefit, and that the, the methodology that was, was used for all of these studies was pretty poor. They, they didn't include this um, AD500 study because it, it hadn't been published yet. Um, but I think that's a, a pretty fair summary. Um, so when you, when you really look at everything in detail, um, you appreciate that uh, the effect is not quite as um, positive as you might hope it would be, and that the outcomes that were demonstrated may or may not matter to anybody. We'll see that again in a minute. It's important also to consider the cost. So cost is a little bit lower, lower now if you're part of a big system like the VA, but if you're going to pay for the pills on your own, they're still about five bucks a day. And when you look at what the cost effectiveness of them is in um, some um, study that's, that's been done, you, you see that it's pretty high. So they've estimated it's about $400 over for six months for one point on the ADAS-COG scale. You say, well, a point, hey, you know, maybe that's worth it. But there's 70 points on this scale. So if you're um, you know, wanting a 10-point drop, which you can't guarantee because people usually don't get that big of a drop, but you're still having a pretty significant investment of money. So here's, here's yet another summary of um, the cholinesterase inhibitors to studies. And this is out of a, a group in Canada that does a very careful and systematic evidence review reviews, they found that even though there were these statistically significant differences, those don't translate into clinically relevant benefits for patients or caregivers. And I, th I think that's a, a, a pretty fair assumption, or a conclusion, rather. So that's, that's cholinesterase inhibitors. Um, the other class of medication is uh, memantine. Uh, and this, this is a totally different class of, of medication. When I talked about the, the neuro, neurotransmitters, uh, I didn't give an overview, but real quickly, it, the neurotransmitters, um, when we talk about them, we tend to, to overvalue um, the ones that they're drugs for, 
like serotonin and dopamine and norepinephrine. But when you really look at how the brain is composed, it's uh, in interesting. So 70% of the, the transmission, neurotransmission in the brain is glutamate, which we never talk about at all. But all the fast, hard wiring of the brain that keeps everything going and makes connections and has thoughts, that's um, glutamate. And NMDA is one of those uh, receptors for glutamate. And then 29% is GABA, which is an inhibitory neurotransmitter. And that counteracts the glutamate and stops your brain from having a seizure all the time. Because if it was just glutamate, it would go out of control. So you have all this um, inhibitory stimulus, too. So if you add up 70 and 29, that's not much left. But all the other neurotransmitters, so you know, these cell bodies look pretty big in the picture here. Um, but really, the, the, the acetylcholine, serotonin, dopamine, and histamine, all of those uh, parts of the brain comprise less than 1% of the cell bodies. So um, when, when you're talking about um, the effect of neurotransmitters, um, you realize that you're going to get a, a pretty small effect, and it's more modulatory. It doesn't affect the whole functioning of the brain. And that explains why there was excitement about memantine, because it seemed to affect the NMDA receptor, which is everywhere and part of the hard wiring. And the, the concept was that if you could tone down the overactivation of the brain that happens in, in Alzheimer's disease, that then you would get a regulation and you would stop the process of cell death that happened and everything would be better. Unfortunately, it, it really didn't work all that. It ha has not worked all that well as a treatment. Um, and most of the studies that they did were using the, the memantine in combination with cholinesterase inhibitors, not, not um, memantine alone. And I'll, I'll show you the, the um, graph there, um, which is from the uh, largest study of, of memantine that's been done so far. And the, the dark bars are the drug, and the light bars are the placebo. And this is by degree of change overall um, in a clinician rated scale. And even for this, which is one of the more positive outcomes, it's hard to know which group you would really prefer to be in. I mean, it's, it's like, be like flipping a coin. You say, well, you know, I, I guess I'd prefer to have a little bit greater chance of no change. But it's not like you're discriminating out between people who really do a lot better and sustain their functioning and people who do a lot worse. And there's plenty of people who were getting the drug who did worse, too. So even though this is an approved medication in, in terms of being able to measure specific changes that happen in cognition or functioning, it's, it's harder to do. And um, as we'll see, the, the medication is indicated only for moderate to severe dementia. So just to remind you this, I'm not trying to say nobody should be taking these or you shouldn't use them because it could be that somebody would be helped by them, but it's very important to, to remember <clears throat> that you shouldn't just give somebody the pill just because they've got that, the condition and that you really want to make sure you accomplish a benefit. The, um, the memantine has a few side effects, and they're kind of hard to pin down. We had a, a study at the VA that involved this and got some very odd side effects. Um, like a, this one guy who just wouldn't stop talking to everybody in public. And then we stopped the medication, and he went back to being himself. And this, this other person developed um, this delusion that he needed to visit his wife's grave, just fixed on that. But she had been cremated. And like he couldn't process this. And we stopped the medication, it went away. Um, and then restarted it, and it came back. So there, there may be um, some unusual uh, co confusion-related effects that happen with this that are harder to pin down. So I'm, I'm hesitant to show this slide for, for too long for fear that you're going to think that, that this is the, uh, the, the centerpiece of the talk. But these are the official uh, FDA indications for the different stages of, of dementia. Um, but once again, this doesn't mean that everybody who's got that stage of dementia should be taking one of these treatments, or that if they did, that it would provide them any kind of consistent benefit, or that if it did provide them a consistent benefit, that it's a benefit that anybody would care about. So this is a review from um, a primary care perspective that I think nicely summarizes the um, state of, of all the treatments for, for uh, Alzheimer's disease. And I wanted to 
spend just a little bit of time going through this. So what they found is that there are these statistically significant improvements in scores on various instruments. So they, there's a lot of fishing expeditions going on. You can pick which instrument happens to, to be um, significant and then publish that. But most of the outcomes aren't used routinely, so they're not things that, that you'd want to measure necessarily as you're seeing patients. And what the uh, demonstrated or published benefits are are hard to interpret. They're, they're challenging. And most of the benefits were not clinically important or their, rel or their importance can't be determined. So this, this really is points out how um, uncertain any measurable benefits are for these medications and whether that, that would justify um, wanting to use them, especially if you were having any um, side effects. So to, just to, uh, to, to underline this again, this is, is to point out that there is um, a lot of ambiguity of, about this data and, and not much certainty. So I wanted to, to turn now to the other um, types of dementia. And I, as I mentioned, this is going to be pretty fast because there's not many uh, FDA-approved treatments. Um, there's only one, and that's not really specifically for um, a, a t another type of dementia. Vascular dementia has no FDA-indicated treatments. There have been a lot of trials, uh, but no consistent results. People have tried cholinesterase inhibitors repeatedly for vascular dementia, and there have been no consistent results. So you can, you can believe with the amount of research that's been uh, conducted that if there was a consistent positive result that it would uh, probably have gotten an FDA indication by now. For Lewy body disease, likewise, there are no FDA-approved uh, treatments. Oddly enough, rivastigmine has an FDA approval for Parkinson's disease associated with dementia, but not for Lewy body dementia. Um, and when they, they did the big studies trying to get an approval, they found that there wasn't an, enough of a consistent effect in Lewy body dementia, which is kind of funny because they're very similar diseases. Um, but more much more importantly than what to do is what to avoid, which is antipsychotics. As we talked about last week, Lewy body disease involves uh, uh, malfunction of the dopamine system. And if you give antipsychotics, which are dopamine blockers, you worsen symptoms uh, both in terms of the motor symptoms like cog cogwheeling, uh, rigidity, st uh, stoop posture, shuffling gait, and you can also worsen the neuropsychiatric symptoms. So if you think somebody's got Lewy body dementia, you, your main goal should be to make sure that you don't give them treatments that are going to harm them. And then frontotemporal dementias, there are no FDA-approved uh, treatments. I looked over this literature and found um, lots of small trials, but really mixed results and surprisingly large number of negative trials that got published. So it, it, this, this one is especially hard to conduct good trials in uh, because there are a wide uh, number of frontotemporal dementias. I, I mentioned last week there are like 13 different types, and each of them shows a, a slightly uh, different uh, clinical picture. And also, it's hard to um, establish exactly what the meaningful outcomes are uh, because people have uh, so many different types of behavioral symptoms that go with it. So I wanted to, I wanted to address real, real quickly a, a pet interest of mine. Um, which is when to stop um, medications. So all, all that I've suggested so far would make you careful about starting them, but assuming somebody's been taking one of these medications for a long time, what do you do with it? Um, assuming it's a progressive disease, people are going to get worse no matter what, whether you treat them or not. And there's that logic that, well, think how bad they would have been if we hadn't been treating them. And there's no way in the case of a single individual to ascertain whether or not they would have been different because then you're dealing with an alternative future. So if you if you look at case reports and talk to, to people who are enthusiastic about medications, they will tell you um, lots of instances where they had a patient who was taking one of these medications and the medication stopped and they got worse. And you think, well, you know, that's because they stopped taking the pill. Um, but that really is a logical fallacy. And in our clinic, we always are careful about this process and go back and look. And very often, there was something else that was going on. So if somebody got admitted to the hospital and they, their pill got stopped there because their medication regimen was cleaned up, 
Well, they're worse. But was it worse because you stopped the pill? No, it's because they were they had a pneumonia or they, they were sick with something else. Or if there was another change in, in their um, treatments that caused them to have a decline that may or may not have been related to the medication. Um, also, a lot of times there was family distress or other types of chaos that was going on at the time that resulted in people saying, oh, I just can't give this pill anymore, and then the patient looks worse. But really, it's very hard to say whether or not it was related to because of stopping the medication. So it's, it's hard to come across cases where people said, well, you know, let's make a reasoned decision and try stopping this and then measure what the, the difference is. And even if you, even if you did that, in an open label way, um, the expectation would uh, influence what, what people would see. So that idea of not giving up hope or it might have been worse without the pill might make people think, well, you know, he does seem worse today. That's probably because we stopped that pill and maybe we need to give it again. So after spending a lot of time thinking about this and talking to people, what we finally decided was that to to really understand what's going on with the medications and knowing to know when to stop them, we need to do a double-blind trial using a placebo control. So we're just starting this trial now at the, the VA, hoping to en enroll patients soon. Um, and basically, it involves a real taper um, or a sham taper. So in the real taper, people get uh, half the dose of their previous medication in an over-encapsulated form, so they don't know what they're getting, uh, for three weeks, and then they stop the pill entirely. And in the, the sham taper, they get exactly what they've been taking, but in an over-encapsulated form, so they don't know what they're getting. And what we're going to measure is whether people want to return back to their previous dose of medication. We don't care about, really care that much about cognitive outcomes because that may or may not matter, but we're asking people to vote with their feet and say, which way did you think was better, either before or after? And it's, uh, I, I frankly have no idea what's going to happen. Um, some people have said, oh, every, you know, people are, when they stop their pills, they're going to get a lot worse and they're going to return. Other people have said, well, you know, I think that the expectation is a huge part of this. And, even when people are getting exactly the same drug, but they're not sure it's the same drug, they're going to get worried and think there's worsening and want to return. So in three years, roughly, I'll be able to, to give you a, a better answer about that. And hopefully, that will give us more information about the um, utility and safety of continuing on medications. It's surprising when you look around the world um, just how variable the recommendations are. So for instance, in Italy, their policy is that if, if somebody has um, a limited amount of activities of daily living and they require assistance, the medications aren't going to help them very much and they stop them routinely, whereas in some of the Scandinavian countries, they pretty much keep everybody on until death. And really, you know, they, they're all working from the same evidence base and there's just no solid evidence about what the, the long-term benefits or harms of the, the treatments is. So that's a, a, a separate issue, but I, I thought I'd mention it. All right, so let's let's turn to probably the, the more important issue than the the preventative um, or cog cognitive um, issues that we were dealing with, which is what to do with people who are agitated, um, because that that really has immediate effects, and it'd be nice to be able to do something with it. And I'm, unfortunately, I'm not going to have a, a lot of um, really evidence-based suggestions for what to do with pills, but I would remind you to think about the big picture. Don't think of pills right away. So if somebody's agitated, think about why they're agitated. And the three reasons we went over last week uh, that, that are, occur most commonly in agitation are, first of all, there's unmet needs. So if somebody's hot, too hot, too cold, hungry, thirsty, they're lonely, they're in pain, they have to go to the bathroom. Any of those is a basic unmet human need, and it's the natural response when you've got an unmet need to get upset, um, and especially if you can't express what it is. So even people who are cognitively intact will get somewhat agitated if they've got unmet needs. Like if, if my talk went on for three or four hours and you couldn't get up, you'd, you'd all get agitated. Um, you don't have the benefit of being out in cyberspace where you can just get up, get up and leave. But um, clearly, un, unmet needs affect everybody's behavior. And somebody who 
can't express their needs is, is likely to act out if they can't do that. The conditioning part of it was that if any, any form of human behavior will continue or even become more frequent if it's rewarded. So if you hit somebody once in a while and you get more positive attention for it, then you'll, you're likely to keep hitting people. And that, that um, really does appear in the behavioral analyses that, that go on. Um, this, this even can apply to uh, the other forms of conditioning, like Pavlovian you know, con conditioning. Uh, th there's this great story about a guy who used, in a nursing home, who used to just like get really upset and start punching people out of the blue, and they couldn't figure out why. And finally, somebody sat down and talked to him and his family and learned that he had been a prize fighter. And um, every time the elevator bell went off, he thought it was his signal to start the round again. So he, he, he that, so that, that was very much built-in conditioning. So it's, it's really important to think of the, the whole person and, and think about why they may be becoming agitated in, instead of just trying to snow them with a pill. And then the, the third part was that people, um, even when they, they have a, a dementia, are still trying to do the right thing and trying to protect themselves and their personal safety. So if somebody came at you and tried to take your clothes off you, you would protect yourself, obviously. And, and likewise, people who, who have dementia and think that they are under threat are going to act out, even, even if we label it as being agitated. So I, I strongly encourage, before turning to pills, to um, think about what's going on with agitation. And the, some of the, the most common triggers are things that you would expect, like um, having an unknown caregiver or a ch change in, in the caregivers. Uh, being moved to a different location obviously really throws off your perception of the safety of the world. Um, a lot of times with my patients, I'll hear that when they took a, a trip to somewhere, it seemed like it was going to be great because they were going to visit the same relatives they visited five years ago, and it was a lovely trip, and they got to catch up with them and they take the trip and it's a disaster because the patient just can't handle the all the cognitive um, burden of traveling and being in a new place. Obviously being sick or hospitalized can be hard. Having house guests even is is really, really difficult. Um, I have a, a number of patients who do just fine as, as long as their life is stable and it's okay, but if they have a house guest they really get agitated. So one guy was up at night almost beating up the house guest because he thought he was an intruder. And then all the other tasks that require a vulnerability. Um, I, I mentioned the, you know, defending yourself if somebody's trying to take your clothes off you, but, but though that, that is a very common trigger, especially in advanced forms of dementia. So I thought I'd mention some of the, the tricks for dealing with agitation without pills <coughs> that, that I've um, come across, mainly from families and and uh, colleagues in social work. Um, and some of these you, you, you may have heard of, but, but a lot of them I hadn't quite appreciated how well they work. So distraction is just like full-on distraction. Somebody's getting upset, say, hey, what do you think of my shirt? Or, you know, come over here and look at this. And you get them out of the situation, divert their attention, and change the frame. And a lot of times that works for, uh, you know, reducing the escalation that's going on, especially if somebody's trying to figure something out that if you can change change their um, space or their, their where, where they're addressing their cognitive energy, that can make a big difference. Just simple well, empathetic at attention um, goes a long way. Uh, and that's hard to come by in uh, nursing homes and other care facilities, which, which are often short-staffed. But just simply being present with somebody, recognizing that they're upset and being able to tolerate it instead of freaking out makes it a difference. There's a lot of great uh, research about uh, music and uh, touch therapy, pet therapy, so uh, things that people find comforting in other ways oftentimes uh, really can help them reduce levels of agitation. Uh, finding what music people used to like listening to and then playing that is, is, a, is a huge uh, boon. And it's interesting that a, a lot of the, the stimuli that the younger people or cognitively intact people seek out, like entertainment on TV, turns out to be overstimulating for, for people with dementia. <clears throat> so uh, if, if it's, it's not very successful just to sit somebody in front of a, a TV set and assume that they're going to calm down. And then this last one is a great trick that I, I learned from a family of uh, somebody who, kept, who had been moved to an, an 
institutional um, facility as a, a, a group home and kept saying he wanted to go home. Like he'd say, I want to go home, I want to go home, I want to go home. And they finally realized that if they took him for a drive, that every time in your life you go for a drive, where do you go back to? Home. So they'd go for a drive, oh, we're going home, you go back and go home. And after a while, he associated the drive with returning home. And um, sure, sure enough, um, he stopped calling out and saying that he needed to go home because what signaled that it was home was that it was where he came back to enough. So somebody's really getting agitated a lot of times just taking him out on a drive and then coming back again will have a, a positive benefit. So let's say you try all these um, and you're still sh uh, short on options. Uh, in the community, people are going to receive antipsychotics. Um, like a third of people in U.S. nursing homes receive an antipsychotic medication, even though when you do chart reviews, the vast majority of it has no real solid indication. Um, but those are the, the standard treatments that are used. And there is some evidence from small studies, mind you, that um, antipsychotics have some improvement in behavioral symptoms compared to placebo. But once again, I'll remind you there is no FDA-approved medication, so it's not like antipsychotics are FDA-approved for treating agitation in, in uh, dementia. And there is, I, I said this last week and, and again today, there's a black box warning, which is about as serious as you can get, um, that people who have dementia-related psychosis who get antipsychotics face an increased risk of death. Like, talking about what different forms of good are, you know, typically avoiding death is a, a bat considered to be a good thing. To, if, um, and so you're putting yourself at risk if you're using these medications. And uh, the risk of death is interesting. It's, it's about 1.6% across all these studies. And initially it was thought that it was just cardiovascular mortality or having something to do with lipids because these medications can change lipids. But when they really, re really reviewed all the data, it's all-cause mortality, including things like infection and uh, pneumonia, falls, um, and so it's not just cerebrovascular events that are associated with death. And it seems like antipsychotics or messing with the dopamine system just throws off people's equilibrium in all sorts of body systems and is, is not a good thing for them. So if you're going to prescribe an antipsychotic to somebody who's got dementia, you really need to carry out an, an informed consent discussion, which, which means talking to the, the family and saying, you know, we're going to try this medication, uh, it's got an increased risk of death, um, and here's what the potential benefits may be, and here's the potential risks, and do you want to use it? And then if you do use it to make sure that you're measuring something so that you'll know that it's having a benefit, um, and in that process to use the lowest possible dose and for the shortest period of time to achieve the benefit, and if you're not having a significant benefit, you want to stop it. I think that's the the problem with nursing homes is that nothing's measured, pill gets started, the person gets better, or they stay the same. You say, well, you know, now they're on this other forward, it must be the pill that's making it better, and they remain on it for a long time, whether or not that was a, a true effect. And then even if you're using one of these, you don't want to stop considering all the other factors that may be involved in agitation, and you don't want to stop um, the, the behavioral approaches. So I mentioned Prazosin last week, and there was quite a bit of interest in it. So I wanted to give more detail about this. Um, this is not an FDA-approved medication. Um, because the, it's an old generic drug, it's unlikely to get an FDA approval. Uh, but the, the data has looked uh, pretty good. So this um, drug is, is an alpha-1 blocker. Uh, which uh, the adrenergic system um, is the one that's involved in flight or, or fight. Um, and it doesn't work very well as a blood pressure medication, which it was, was originally marketed as as mini press. For it to have a consistent effect on blood pressure, you need to use doses of about 20 milligrams a day. And that's important to use when you're talking to to, or important information to have when you're talking to people about using this medication because there's especially um, other clinicians are concerned about lowering blood pressure and you say well you need 20 to have an effect on blood pressure and we're going to use like one to two to start and that's pretty pretty big difference generally very safe no significant interactions 
Um, and I don't know if you've heard about Prazosin for nightmares, but it's um, got a pretty strong history of uh, being used to treat nightmares, and it was developed at our, our own VA. And um, I, as I mentioned, it's off-label, but the, the one study that came out done by Lucy Wong um, at, at our VA suggested that it really was effective um, in reducing uh, agitation and behavioral problems in the setting of uh, moderate to advanced dementia. In her study, they went to a, a total dose of four milligrams twice a day. It was a pretty small sample size, which is, I think everybody was surprised that they got a significant effect because it was so few people. But they're doing another study now where they're pushing the dose even higher. So these are, are my general recommendations based on my clinical experience that um, if you start one milligram at bedtime, I've never had anybody have any problems with that. And then you, you continue to go up in about one milligram, in, in one milligram increments every three to four days until the ad agitation improves. Um, and if you don't go above about 10 milligrams total, you're being very safe. So this um, is, of, of all the pills I give out, this is the one that I, only one that I've had families come back and say, you know, you can stop all the rest of the pills, but don't take away my prazosin. Because in some cases, it really has made a big difference. And I, I think it makes sense that it's just overall, low, lowering people's overall level of agitation. And you, you know the feeling, if you, you know, the adrenaline rush feeling. And if you went around feeling like that was your constant state of being, um, you would be more likely to be agitated. And if you can tone that down a little bit, then that would give you a little bit extra fuse. So Prazosin has um, been uh, a useful treatment for us. And uh, I think there will be more information about that in the future. So one of the questions that came up last week was, how do you convince other providers not to use antipsychotics? And um, hopefully, by giving them other suggestions, such as trying Prazis, and there, there will be uh, more chance for avoiding antipsychotics um, and uh, thus uh, saving them from potential harm. F finally, um, it wouldn't be complete just to, to leave it at antipsychotics and Prazis. And there's a a large list of other medications that have been tried for treating behavioral problems. None of them, again, are FDA approved, but uh, sometimes they can have some benefit. So trazodone is used for sleep typically, but um, it can be used either on a scheduled or as needed basis for um, agitation. And um, there's some people who se seem to re respond pretty well to this. We tend to use doses of like 25 to 50 milligrams, to three, three or so times a day. The, the dosing guideline is, is very rough on that. And it tends not, not to make people too tired at those low doses. So it's not just like you're putting them to sleep all day. Uh, pretty much all the SSRIs have been tried. And sometimes they seem to take the edge off a little bit, but certainly they're not an, an overall fix. Anti-epileptic or seizure medications, especially Depakote, um, seems to shorten or to uh, to lengthen people's fuse a little bit to to make them less likely to get agi agitated or upset um, but that one too um, you have to be somewhat careful with and it doesn't have a guaranteed response and then benzodiazepines like uh, Ad ativan lorazepam can be used and certainly are used but you really need to be careful with those because they can disinhibit people and sometimes worsen symptoms and when you look at the Beer's criteria for medications that should not be used in older people, the benzodiazepines are on there. So I'm really not recommending benz benzos, but um, just to, to tip you off that, that if they are used, you need to be very, very careful about their use. And then <clears throat> probably even, even more importantly, um, just like with Lewy body and avoiding antipsychotics, it's, it's really important if you're dealing with somebody who's got dementia to avoid anticholinergic medications because these clearly worsen cognitive symptoms. If you ever have taken you know, Benadryl for allergies, you know that the feeling that you get. And if you've got dementia, it's 10 times worse than that. So, and, and the effect does not go away quickly. So anti, anticholinergic medications really are not good for anybody with dementia. And these are also on the Beers criteria for anybody who is an older adult. So if at all possible, you want to avoid these. 
Ditropan gets used a lot. There, there may be cases where it's needed for urinary symptoms, but there are quite a few people we see where it, it really is worsening their cognitive symptoms. And the, the uh, Benadryl, Unisom, and Dramamine, or the diphenhydramine hydroxyzine and di, uh, dimenhydronate, got to work on saying that one, are um, antihistamines. Um, and th those have pretty strong anticholinergic properties. And then doxylamine is an over-the-counter uh, sleep aid. So <clears throat> the uh, Benadryl and uh, Unisom are, and Dramam I guess Dramamine is not over-the-counter, but th those two definitely are over-the-counter. And you want to make sure you, you see if people are using over-the-counter preparations. I just saw a guy this morning where um, I had not asked before specifically, but today found out that he take, has been taking a lot of Unisom every night, and that probably explains a big part of his problem. So just once, once again, um, instead of spending a ton of time trying to focus on what to use, it really repays more effort to cleaning up people's medication regimens and to make sure they're not getting something that's making them worse. So I wanted to, to give one more bit of context for, for this in my sales pitch about where to put your effort if you're dealing with people who have dementia. And um, clearly, you can spend a lot of time focusing on pills. Um, but uh, when you look at the, the big picture about what's the, the bang for your buck in terms of different interventions, what you, you find is that the non-pharmacologic interventions uh, seem to have quite a bit more benefit. So what you see on the right is the time to nursing home placement compared comparing placebo and dineptazil in that big AD500 study, and there was really no difference there. Some of the, the other drug studies have found a delay in nursing home placement of about three months for people who were on a cholinesterase inhibitor compared to a placebo. And you say, well, you know, that makes a big difference. If you're paying $10,000 a month, then three months is a big deal. But when you compare this to psychosocial interventions, you see that the effect is far less. So this is a, a research that was done by Mary Middleman, who's a nurse researcher in New York, who did caregiver support as the whole intervention. Really nothing specifically directed at the patient. Uh, caregivers would come in to classes and learn about what um, dementia was and behavioral approaches for dealing with it and how to care for themselves and how to um, make sure that they were getting enough support and taking advantage of community resources. Um, and then they had some other um, specific uh, counseling and one-on-one -on -one care that went, went into the intervention. But it was all geared at the caregiver. And the patient was, you know, had some babysitting during that time, but they, there was no treatment applied to them. And when you look at the difference between the treatment group, which is in blue, and the usual care group, which is in yellow, and measure the horizontal distance, which is the time to nursing home placement, you see that that's about 18 months. So helping the caregiver is really where the money is in terms of providing better dementia care. And that if, if you can make sure the caregiver is able to get some time for him or herself, that they have um, their mental health needs attended to, and they, they get adequate support, and that they understand what they're dealing with, you will get far more benefit than if you assume the problem is a broken brain and that you're going to fix the broken brain with pills. So um, even though our, our topic today was only about medications, I, I think it really is important to remember that part of it and um, to, to recollect that if you really want to help people, that, that's what you can focus on. So, to, to return to these these four questions again, I hope that uh, by discussing all of the, uh, the context for the uh, medications and what they are, as, as well as the, the meaning of, of what medications are, you'll have some new appreciation for how you could uh, make a different choice about what you advise people to, to do, and um, that you base that choice not on what you think the science says, but rather on your understanding of where the, the patient and their family is coming from and how you can help them to accomplish their ends. All right. so. I'm going to, let's open it up for questions. So, okay. Oh, yeah, I, I can see that one. So, this is the, uh, the Boston study looked at folks who are high risk for dementia. So, this is a great question. So, this, um, this was a study called ADAPT. Um, 
And they took people who had a very strong uh, family risk for, for dementia. So these, I, I mentioned that the genetic risk is not that high, not that much of a contribution last week, and that we tell people that the majority of people with dementia don't have a relative with dementia, which is true. But if you're looking for a sample that's enriched for the greater likelihood of dementia, you'll pick this one. So that wasn't really integral to the study design because they had enough people enrolled that they were able to um, measure the rate of um, dementia onset. This study was interesting also because um, they had to stop it early uh, because of the Celebrex was pulled from the market. So there were, there were all sorts of other challenges. And the initial um, in data was pretty much a wash, and then when they reanalyzed it, it looks like, looked like the people who were getting NSAIDs had a slightly higher risk of, um, of developing dementia. So uh, that's a, a great question. So the other question from uh, Kenny Lake is, what do the um, FDA, AD, FDA approved drugs do for the other types of dementia? And that's, a, that's another great question. Like, I, I, last week I tried to point out the differences between all the forms of dementia in terms of the um, neuropathology. And basically, all the, the other drugs, um, which are cholinesterase inhibitors for the other forms of, I mean, the other forms of dementia are also um, generally treated with cholinesterase inhibitors. So my, my thought on this is that a cholinesterase inhibitor increases some sort of cognitive functioning regardless of who's getting it. But even if you give it to somebody who's cognitively intact, you'll get some kind of change. Um, but it's not like those other forms are specifically addressing the core problem, which is exactly the, the challenge, that none of these pills gets in there and fixes what we assume the deficits to be. Um, the other ne next question is, are there any significant side effects from prazosin? So that's, that's a great question. And I'm, so it's an antihypertensive, um, and at higher doses it can drop blood pressure, which Typically, in the population we deal with, it, the VA is good because most of them have high blood pressure to begin with. But there is sometimes a first dose effect. So the very first time somebody takes it, even at a low dose, they get a bigger drop in blood pressure. Um, so we rec recommend that the very first dose people take in bed. Uh, but otherwise, there are really no significant side effects, which is, is surprising um, and kind of rare to find in a medication. So that's a, a great question about prazosin. So the next one is about what medication options are there for sundowning syndrome um, and any use for benzodiazepines to uh, promote sleep and I hope that means prevent agitation. Uh, so sundowning is a, a challenging one. Um, and so sundowning is the phenomenon that the people seem to get worse later in the day. And there's been some carefully conducted research on this that suggests that it may not really be part of a natural rhythm within the patient or with about the, the way the symptoms present, but rather um, and either environmentally determined, um, which is typically it's the change of shift time or the caregiver's been working all day long and their fuse is short and they're pretty tired and the, the patient picks up on this. So in settings that have more frequent shift changes or that the shift changes don't map onto the circadian rhythm, there seems to be less incidence of sun, what we call sundowning. And all the, the evidence of, about Alzheimer's and the circadian rhythm is that the circadian rhythm just gets kind of fragmented over time and people spend less time asleep and, and awake. So if it's... Um, it's not necessarily an entity in and of itself, sundowning, nor are there any specific uh, treatments that are used for it. But I would, I would encourage exactly the same approach as to other forms of agitation or getting worked up, and especially to pay attention to the things that happen at the end of the day, instead of saying, oh, this person's got sundowning because they've got Alzheimer's, and therefore we need to give them a pill for it. Um, and then the, the question for... Um, so, to, so basically, no specific medication, but just to think about agitation more generally. And then benzodiazepines to promote sleep and agitation. Uh, benzodiazepines, you've got to be, be careful with um, for a number of reasons. I encourage you to, to look at the Beers criteria um, and to, to make sure that you're getting a, a real benefit from those. And then for reducing agitation, certainly 
They're the, the treatment of choice for younger people who are agitated, like in an inpatient psychiatric unit, but their benefits in um, dementia can be kind of questionable. So if you've tried other approaches, really not having them work, people are desperate, sometimes benzodiazepines can have a benefit, but I would encourage you, um, as with the antipsychotics, to really think carefully and to try to use the lowest possible dose for the longest period of time. So uh, the question from Providence is, um, have there been sleep studies done in Alaska regarding sundowning with various changes of light and dark? Yeah, this, so this is a, a great question about um, that the focus is on circadian rhythm also. And uh, I, I believe that uh, one of the key organizers for this series, uh, Dr. Vidiello, is, uh, has, has done a lot of research in this area, is an expert in sleep. Um, and what, what they find in dementia is that, the, as I mentioned, the sleep-wake cy sleep cycle just starts to fall apart. And people like all of us have a pretty strong built-in rhythm for when we should be awake and when we're asleep. And people with Alzheimer's have that, that um, not hold up quite as well. Um, and so some of the, the treatments that seem to work are um, increasing daylight exposure during periods of wake and then making sure that there's darkness when you're supposed to be asleep. So you can help to reconstruct some of the fragmentation by doing things like um, sunrooms, I guess is what they, they used to call it in the old days, where you make sure that when people are awake, they're really getting a ton of natural light exposure. And then when they're asleep, they're not exposed to an, a lot of um, artificial light. So I'm, I'm guessing that in um, Alaska, where there's a more severe light uh, dark um, cycles, that, that there may be other effects. And, and I would guess that um, those would contribute to some of the fragmentation that you see. So the, uh, the, the point here about chemical soup seems to cause more problems than less. I, I certainly would agree with that. And when I, I think about my role for a, a lot of the, the patients, I see um, it's, it, I much more, provide much more benefit by cleaning up their medications rather than adding medications. And, and I hope that um, that's a, a trend that can be continued. The Beers criteria, the American Geriatric Society, um, so the question is how often that gets updated. Um, and that, uh, they updated every couple years. I um, was getting information about that ready for another, another talk I'm giving, um, went over yesterday. I think they've, they had one in 2014. Um, and I think there was one before that in 2012. So it's every couple years. And really, they don't change it that much. If you haven't looked at the Beers criteria, I would recommend that you check it out um, because it's an interesting list of the way they organize it and what they recommend. Yeah. Great, great question. So the first one about weight loss, exactly this, you know, the, the studies, most of them that I, I showed were short term, you know, they're like a, a year, maybe two years, and that AD 500 one is a five-year study, which was one of the longer studies, and the longer studies have shown there is consistent uh, across the board, like on average weight loss for people who get cholinesterase inhibitors long term. And it makes sense because it's increased in gastric motility and probably causing a little bit of diarrhea at times. So that's one of the rationales for trying to figure out if, if and when we can safely stop medications because it's not like these are just risk-free. So there is clear evidence of, of weight loss with long-term use. And then it's, it's, you know, it's hard to quantify. I think the average was about 5%. Um, which is is a, is a big deal. So in case you didn't didn't know it, weight loss is a huge problem if you're over about age 70. If you lose 15% of your body weight, your chances of you know, being dead in a year or something are tripled. And it's a, it's a really big problem. And then in terms of how to um, broach a discussion about the medications, it's, it's a, a tough um, issue to bring up for those reasons I was mentioning before that that people have this, it could have, it would have been worse mentality. 
And the last thing you want to do is tell them, hey, guess what? This pill you've, you've been giving all along may, maybe was doing nothing. Uh, or maybe it was even causing harm when you thought you were helping them. So the, the way I've, I've found it more useful is to ask the, the patient and the family, what do you think these pills are, are doing for you? And how would you know if they were doing something for you? And if, and if they're not able to come up with anything, then a lot of times they will think up, well, you know, what if we tried stopping it for a while to see if it would work? And I'll say, yeah, let's do that. Um, and so it, it works much better if, if they see it as their idea rather than as you coming out and saying, oh, we're, we're out of options, sorry, you know, good luck to you. The, the sto story is interesting insofar as um, the Canadian government had established policies to take people off of cholinesterase inhibitors when they entered into nursing care after a month. So they would measure their functional and cognitive stat behavioral status if they had been on the medication and then take them off and then reassess and see if they worsened, then they would try the medication again as a, as a policy, which is very rational. Um, and the, the people I talked to who worked in this setting said that there were not that many cases that they had to restart. Um, just because most people are like a wash, whether, whether they had been on it or not. But then there was a lawsuit uh, brought by um, a drug company backed group that said that this was discriminating against people who were in nursing homes because if you were in the community, the government would pay for the pill, but if you were in the nursing home, they weren't going to pay for it and they had to scrap the whole thing. So there's a, certainly a lot of politics in, involved here too. Um, but, but that's a, a great question about how to get people engaged in thinking about other treatment options. And, and I, the, the part of it that, that's missing is the upfront discussion when you start the pill to say, you know, we're going to use this to see if it helps treat symptoms, but if it's not treating the symptoms that you care about, we really shouldn't keep using it. Instead of, oh, you've got dementia, here's your pill for dementia, you're going to take it forever, like it was a, a vitamin. All right, well, I think... Um, Unfortunately, we're out of time. And once again, please feel free to email me. I think I forgot my email address, but it's on the slides from last time. It's just uh, S-T-H-I-E-L-K-E at U-W dot E-D-U. Thanks very much.